Well, hello again. We are going to look at part six in our study here of Hebrews, starting uh, in verse uh, one of chapter four. Uh, we, we ended chapter three last week, basically by asking to whom God swore that those who had disobeyed would not enter his rest. And so now he wants to address that the promise that he had given still stands. So it was meant to put fear of God in the hearers when this was being written. Um, so I, I think that this chapter here is going to stand out above the rest because it's going to show that the author is going to really try to develop a point here that is going to drive everything home. And so to get the full context of this, uh, we're going to back up to chapter 3, verse 18, just to read it, just to, again, keep the context, because keep in mind, chapter breaks did not come uh, in the original language here. That's something that we have put in. It says here in verse 18, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. So we can see that faith here is equated with obedience. They weren't allowed to enter rest. We're going to talk about what that means here in a minute. But the reason they didn't is because of unbelief. Now, just I, I can't stress this enough. Faith is equated with obedience. You know, when we look at the, uh, the sola phrases like sola scriptura, Sola fide, you know, grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, all those things. What's very fascinating to me is none of those are in the scripture, except for one, and even that it's taken out of context, where we see faith alone. If you go look at James 2, I believe it's verse 24, it says that we are saved not by faith alone, but by works. Isn't that interesting? Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time to get into that, but what I want you to see is that it's not faith alone, that works must be there. Now, I'm not putting you under legalism. I'm saying this, if there is not works, you do not have faith. In other words, we can, we can say all day long, I believe in Jesus until the cows come home, but it doesn't make you a Christian. Okay, even the devil believes in God and shudders. And so faith has to be connected with works. Anyway, let's move on and get started here to chapter 4, verse 1. It says this, Therefore, connecting chapter 3 there, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So there remains a promise. Now, isn't that interesting? Because in the Old Testament, didn't they already receive the promise? They, they entered into the promised land. They had attained it. And yet now he's saying here that there is a promise that remains of entering his rest. What is he saying? If they already had the rest, but yet he's telling us there's a rest to come. Let me just give you some examples here in the Old Testament that they did achieve the rest. The promise had been fulfilled. Look at this in Joshua chapter 21, verse 43. It says, So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers. So the promises, he gave them to them. They were fulfilled. They took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn or promised to their fathers. Not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren as he promised them. Now therefore return and go to your tents into the land of your possession. See, it's clearly saying the Lord gave them rest just as he had promised. So how is Hebrews, the author here, now saying, they did not enter that rest. I mean, put yourself into the shoes uh, of the, the listeners back when this was written. They would have been going, what are you talking about? We're in the promised land. Okay? Now, maybe some were saying, well, we're still under Roman rule and whatnot. 
And in part, I think that they understood that more than what we do today. But we'll come to that here in a minute. Let's look at one more example. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 55, it says, Then he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. So, even in time, the time of Solomon here, it is telling us that God had given them rest, just as he had promised. So, how is the author of Hebrews saying that they never entered the rest again? That is the question that we need to look at here. Well, again, here is that verse, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest. There's something in a, kind of a fancy theological term called inaugurated eschatology. I like to just say dual prophecy, and it is everywhere in Scripture. And I think but part of the problem where we get into in churches today is we take a scripture, we just isolate it, and we just see it as it is, face value, a literal truth, and that's it. But that's not how a Jewish understanding of scripture is. A Jew understands that there are many layers of this scripture. Uh, they have three different types of understanding, a literal, uh, kind of a symbolic type uh, understanding, and one that it's kind of an application to our lives. And so uh, one example could be uh, when we look in um, uh, Matthew, when we see that in, I believe it's chapter 17, he goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Moses and Elijah appear. And the disciples say, you know, before this or right after this, why do the scribes and the Pharisees basically say that Moses and Elijah must come first? And Jesus' answer is, well, I tell you the truth. Um, Moses, uh, Elijah did come. And then he goes on, he says, but Elijah will come. You see, there was a prophetic per, uh, picture um, that Elijah did come, not only in the past, but in the spirit of uh, John the Baptist. But then he says, but he will come, fulfilling what the last verses of the Old Testament say, that before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Elijah would come. And so there's more than one meaning to that verse. You could say that there is a temporal and an eternal level to God's promises. And so this is what it means. When a promise remains of entering his rest, we have to understanding, understand there's more than one meaning to this here. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 6 says this, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, with his mighty angels. So this verse here in the New Testament is even telling us when the author of Hebrews is talking about, about this promise that's yet to come. It says that when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So the final fulfillment of this rest being spoken of is when the Lord comes back. So in Hebrews, he's saying that, you know, he understood that the, the rest talked about is going to be achieved only in part by going into the promised land. And that going into the promised land is really supposed to point us to a heavenly fulfillment, a final fulfillment. And the writer of Hebrews understood this. He understood the Bible differently than many people read it here today. He's still using the prophets, using the Old Testament, to these people here in the New Testament, to bring out a point. Just like on the road to Emmaus, Jesus used the law and the prophets to bring out a point, to point out who Jesus is and was and is to come. So let's look at the Old Testament here to get some insights into the author's mind here um, as we look in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 17. He says, you shall diligently keep. Now, the word there in Hebrew is shamar. Uh, 
to protect. It's the very same word that when God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden, he was there to shamar it, to protect the garden, to protect his home, to protect his family from uh, any evil. And so anyway, here it says, you shall diligently keep or protect the commandments of the Lord your God his testimonies, and his statutes, which he has commanded you. Now, I love that. First of all, we are commanded to protect and to keep these things. Today, if anything, we do the opposite. We don't try to protect the commandments. We try to sweep them under the rug, and we say, oh, you don't need to do those anymore. We're under grace. We're under grace. Well, yes, we're under grace, but don't forget that faith without works is dead. And in my faith, I'm going to protect and keep these commandments. In verse 18, he says that you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, that you may go in and possess the good land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. So notice that you can read this on one hand and say, well, in the Old Testament, if they were good, and if they did good works, they were going to get to go to their promised land. Well, what you got to understand is that this is also speaking of a future heavenly fulfillment, that he's saying, if you keep my commandments today, you will get to go in and possess the land of rest, heaven. Okay? So, Keep in mind that dual fulfillment. The commandments have not gone away. And I know people read Colossians and they read Galatians and even here, uh, or Romans, and they try and say that the law has been taken away. I, uh, we don't have time to get into it here right now, but uh, I can promise you that is not the case or the context of any of those verses. Okay? You have to understand that salvation not even in the Old Testament, depended upon their works. It still depended upon the grace of God, even in the Old Testament. We'll we'll talk about that another time as well. Just like today, my works don't get me into heaven. It is God's grace that does that. But if I am living in disobedience, I really don't have faith, and therefore I am not getting into heaven. This is a perfect example here, though, this verse, that in the days of Moses, there was a real-life application. You keep the commands, you go into the, the land of Israel. You don't keep the commands, you don't go in. But again, this was a temporal promise, not an eternal one, as their history shows. I mean, when they got into the promised land, their life was filled with tribulations and trials, wasn't it? Their temple was destroyed. The Babylonians came and took them captive. The Assyrians came and and scattered uh, the northern kingdom. So, likewise, what God has given us today in Jesus Yeshua isn't the whole story. Okay, forgiveness right now isn't the whole story. I'm not in my promised land. I'm not in the kingdom of God fully yet until he comes back and wipes away every tear every tribulation, every trial. So, what this is supposed to do here in Hebrews is that, in a sense, it's making the Old Testament, the Torah, relevant for you today. So that when you read the Old Testament, you read it as prophetic in more than just, oh, the Jews got to go into the Holy Land of Israel. No, it's prophetic in the sense that he's speaking of a greater rest, a greater promised land to come, one that this New Testament author is pointing us to. Matter of fact, let's look at the New Testament and see if this is consistent with what Jesus himself said. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25, we see that there was a certain lawyer. Now, by the way, this is a man who is an expert in the law of God. And he stood up and he tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, What shall I do to have eternal life? Now, before we read on on this, I'm going to just kind of hide that slide again because I want you, I just want you to think about something. If I would ask you, what would you say to a person if someone came up to you and said, what must I do to get to heaven? What would your answer be? I'll bet most of you would say, well, believe in Jesus. 
Go read your Bible. Believe. That's all you got to do. Just believe. Remember, earlier here I just pointed out, even the devil believes in God. There must be more to it. You know, this whole phrase, what would Jesus do? How about not what would Jesus do, but let's look at what did Jesus do? Let's look here in Luke 10 again. What is Jesus, the master, our role model? What was his response to someone who came and said, what should I do to be saved? What shall I do to have eternal life? Well, verse 26, he said to him, what's written in the law? He takes him back to the Old Testament and says, what's your reading of it? How do you understand the Old Testament? How do you understand the law? Well, verse 27, the man answers, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. Earlier we talked about this structure um, in, in a previous study here on Hebrews where this is throughout Scripture that you can sum up the Ten Commandments in love God, love your neighbor. So he says to him, was the man right or was he wrong? Jesus says, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. You see, he's turning an expert in the law to the Torah, to the Old Testament to show how we are to love God. How do we love God? By keeping his commands. And by the way, he's quoting Deuteronomy 6 here. Just like James and other people, don't just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. That's all Jesus is saying. The same thing that is consistent through the book of James, through the book of 1 John, through the book of Romans, through the book of Galatians, all throughout the New Testament. You know, I used to look at this and think, well, this is when Jesus came, he was under the law, and so then after he dies, there's a whole new set of rules. And I, I've learned I'm wrong. I'm completely wrong in this. What Jesus taught is truth. What Jesus taught is, if you love me, you're going to do what I say. But the difference was this. He gave us the Holy Spirit to empower us, to live in us, that we no longer have a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh, meaning one that is tender, one that can be taught, one that can obey through the Spirit of God. I can do all things through Christ who lives in me. That's the difference. You see, in the Old Testament, they had no power, they had no strength to do these things. But in the New, he has put this law on our hearts. He has not abolished it. Not one jot, not one tittle will pass away until heaven and earth disappear. So it's still here. But now he has empowered us to be able to obey, not for salvation. Again, I can't stress that enough. Because I can't obey it fully, and it has to be kept fully in order for me to be uh, able to attain salvation through works. I'd have to be perfect. No man can be. Okay, But Christ came and did for us, but now he empowers us to follow that law, and when we fail, there's no condemnation. Matthew 19.6 we see here uh, another man, a completely different example here. This guy comes and says, or it says here, Behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So basically the same question by another man. So Jesus answers him, Why do you call me good? No one's good but one. That is God. But then he goes on, he says, But, if you want to enter into life, in essence, eternal life, keep the commandments. What is Jesus saying here? I mean, can you imagine if Jesus came into any church today and said this? They would tar and feather him. They'd kick him out. No, no, no. It's by grace we've been saved. By grace, by grace. Works. We don't have to do anything. Well, that's not what James said when he says, Faith without works is dead, that we are not saved by faith alone, but by works. 
Okay? Jesus was not being inconsistent with the Word of God. We are the ones that are being inconsistent. The problem is, is we misunderstand what good works means. We aren't trying to, or Jesus never tried to say that if you are keeping the commandments that you can earn your own way to heaven. He was saying, by keeping the commandments, you're showing that you love me, that you obey God. Okay, that's what he's saying. What do all these Ten Commandments mean? Well, they're all summed up in, in basically this. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, by keeping the commandments, all we're doing is loving God. That's what gets us to heaven. Hebrews 4.1, again, just looking at that, it says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, lest... Okay, let us fear. Let us fear God. Do we have fear of God in our society, in our world today, in the churches? No, we've done everything to remove the fear of God. We've done everything to make us feel at home, at peace, remove any conviction, so that when we come into the church doors, we're happy, happy, happy. We don't want to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I had one lady that I was witnessing to one time tell me, you know, you should come to my church sometime. She said, uh, you know, he, our pastor is great. He, he, he tells us how good we are. I don't want to hear how bad we are. You see, that's the, the, the mantra of modern churchianity today, is remove the fear of God. But here it's saying, you have to remember that we still have a rest to enter, and we are to remember that, because otherwise, you may seem to come short or fall short of that rest. Fear God. What's it mean to fear God? Well, I think it's to hold Him in esteem, to hold His commandments into this esteem. And realize that we are going to fall short of His commands. We need Jesus, but we should strive to obey. So, uh, bottom line, you know, we, we can't tell people, oh, you're not reading your Bible, you're not praying, you're not going to church, it's okay just as long as you believe in God. That's not the message that Jesus is portraying here. Let's go on to verse 2. It says, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Now, before we go on, the gospel was preached to us. We understand that. The, 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 he's talking to the people who are listening there. But what's he saying as well as to them? Who's the them? Well, the people who died in the wilderness, those who did not enter that rest. But what I want you to understand as well is don't miss this point. The gospel was preached to them. Wait a minute. The Old Testament? The Gospel? I thought the law was preached to them, that God gave them the Ten Commandments. No, it's saying, indeed, the Gospel was preached to those who did not enter His rest. The Gospel was preached to them from the Old Testament, from the Torah, from the law of God. Yet so many people think the Gospel is only a New Testament thing. But here, the author of Hebrews is telling us, no, the gospel was also preached to them. Remember, Jesus said that you guys study the Old Testament. You read these scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the, the, the scriptures that testify about me. You see, the Old Testament is a testimony of Jesus. Jesus himself said that. That's how on the road to Emmaus he could preach from the law and the prophets about himself. And so, yes, the gospel was preached to them. And that ought to put a whole different perspective on how you read the Old Testament. you got to stop listening and, and reading it from a perspective of, oh, this is all law. No, it's all Jesus. And Jesus is the law. He never got rid of it. He just gave us a way to fulfill it. Now, it goes on, but... The word which they heard, the gospel, did not profit them. 
Isn't that consistent with what today it says? That not to, you know, basically in the Old Testament, don't throw your pearls before swine, but in Corinthians it says the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. Nothing new here. He goes on, why? Okay, the word which they heard, the gospel that they heard didn't profit them. Why? Because it wasn't mixed with faith in those who heard it. Guys, it's no different today. There are people today who are hearing the gospel and it will not profit them because it's not mixed with faith. If it's not mixed with faith, they will not obey. And that is exactly what Hebrews is going to continue to say here. This isn't me interpreting it. This is exactly what this author of Hebrews is saying. You, you cannot have faith without obedience. It takes faith to walk in obedience. Look what verse 3 says. Keep in mind the context of verse 2. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now that seems a little confusing, doesn't it? It seems like a contradiction. Well, all he's doing here is contrasting and making a, a comparison to those who believe and those who don't. The wicked from the righteous. Because then he says, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, taking you back to creation here again, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Well, where is the place that he speaks of that? Genesis 2. Okay, at the time of creation. We'll look at that in a moment. But he says, and again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. See, we who believed do enter. But those that do not enter are those that do not believe. They are those that do not follow and obey. Although the works were finished. Why is he talking about works here? Well, that's what we're going to look at here in a moment. But let me just show you Genesis 2. What he's referring to here, he's again taking you back to the Old Testament. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he, what? It says he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. All the work he had done, he rested from it. Then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So, what we're seeing here is two things happen on the Sabbath, the Shabbat. It was blessed and it was set apart. He sanctified it. That's what it means to be sanctified is to be set apart. So this is to point us to a heavenly rest here in Hebrews, right? And so what he's saying is that that day on creation, you know, 6,000 years ago, somewhere in there, we see that God blessed that day and he set it apart. How did he set it apart? We see in Exodus 20, he says, because I worked six days and rested on the seventh, you too are now to work six days and rest on the seventh. I am setting this day apart. I am blessing it so that when you keep this, which by the way is one of the Ten Commandments, that you're not going to miss this picture that I'm trying to set apart for you. A reminder of our future rest, our heavenly home. That's what the author of Hebrews is trying to tell us. But today, we've said, oh, the commandments, we're done with those. And, and some people, they say, well, we, we like the Ten Commandments, but we really only follow nine of them. Because remember, the Sabbath day and keep it holy, we don't really need to do that. Well, no, that's not what he's saying. We're supposed to set this, part of, uh, set this day apart. We're supposed to shamar, protect it, because there's a picture that God wants you to see. There's a memorial that he wants you to remember. And that is... I created and I rested. Therefore, you too 
okay, are going to look forward to the seventh day when you will rest from all your works as well, that it will all be done. And he's not talking about today. He's talking about when the Lord returns. You see, a day of creation means something. A day of creation, uh, even Martin Luther and and the Jews have always said that a day of creation represents a, a thousand years of history. And you can follow this through. My book on Revelation will go through it more, but uh, it kind of stems off of 2 Peter 3, verse 8, where it says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. You see, Six days of creation equals six thousand years of rest. Then the, or not of rest, but of work. And then there's a seventh day or a seventh day rest. This is why we see the last day mentioned so many times in the New Testament. Okay, we're supposed to look forward to a Shabbat, to a last day, with anticipation uh, for the Lord's return where all work will rest and cease, because the Sabbath is prophetic. You see, John 6, verse 39 says, This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all those who he has given me, but raise them up when? At the last day. A, a Jewish mind is going to take them to creation, the seventh day, the Shabbat. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Uh, my book on Revelation goes through this in much greater detail, but in a short nutshell, if you look at day one of creation, we see that He separates light and darkness. You look at the first thousand years of history, it's dominated by Adam. He lives to be 930 years. And what is He known for? Separating good from evil, light from dark. Okay, The second day of creation, we see he separates waters. The second thousand years of creation is dominated by Noah. And what happens with Noah? Well, the flood waters, right? That's what he's known for. And yet we have separating waters for day two. Day three of creation, we see that land is formed. Vegetation. Well, the third thousand years of, uh, of creation is dominated then by God calling Abraham. And what does Abraham do? God is calling someone to be his chosen nation, to fill the earth. And so we see that God plants, you might say, vegetation or his seed uh, on the earth to fill it and to call a people his own. And that's what we see with the land forming and vegetation filling it. The fourth day of creation is sun, moon, and stars. The fourth thousandth year of history is dominated then by Jacob and his children. Jacob is, even in Joseph's dream, seen as the sun and the moon and his son, brothers as stars, as those stars bow down before, his, before him. And so... We see in, in a few places that, that Israel and the 12 tribes of Israel are pictured as the stars. And so the sun, moon, and stars being created on day four match up with the next thousand years of the sun, moon, and stars, the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob and, and his wife. We see the fifth day of creation is a uh, sea uh, the, is filled. The waters are filled with birds in the air and fish in the sea. Remember on uh, the second day of creation, the waters were divided, sky and sea. So now these things are filled, the sky with birds, the sea with fish. Uh, by the way, on day one, it was light and darkness, and on day four, he fills that. He fills the night with the uh, moon and stars. He fills the day with the sun, because the sun wasn't there until the fourth day. Light was there, uh, but that light was Jesus, the light of the world. But anyway, um, we see day five then being filled. Now, the 5,000th year of history, uh, 
is really dominated by a New Testament period, which it's very interesting to me that the New Testament symbols are fish and dove, right? The symbol of, of God in the New Testament. And so that's what we see is, is filling um, God's land now, or the sea, the ocean, uh, the nations. And by the way, in Scripture we see waters um, are often pictured as nations. And so we see nations of God's people. Day six of creation, we see land animals and man are created, filling the earth. Day, and by the way, that fills the dry land and the vegetation, now become animals and people filling that. But for the 6,000th year of history, what we are in now, what we are completing we see more than ever man has filled the earth. Population is, has grown exponentially. Uh, you look and you can see that uh, I believe there was one quarter billion people on earth at the time of Christ. Today we're at you know over seven billion people. And uh, I think in 1999 it was maybe I think five billion. So it is just rapidly growing and filling the earth. But anyway, that just gives you kind of a picture of this pattern. But obviously then the seventh day, the, the main part of this study is that last day to enter that rest. And the seventh day of creation was rest. That's pointing to what Hebrews chapter 4 here is going to talk about. There remains a Sabbath rest, a heavenly home for all God's people. And so we have to be careful, as he said before, that we don't want to, uh, I guess, not protect this day, not shamar this day, because, as he says, lest you don't enter it. That we have to keep that fear of God, or else you may not enter. That fear of God is important. There remains this rest. Let us fear. Let us fear God. Let us put those commandments on the forefront of our mind, or else you may fall short of this day. So we haven't looked at very many verses here, just these three verses, but it's showing us the importance of keeping this on the forefront of our mind, and fearing God. Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. Nowhere in the New Testament does it tell us not to fear God. As a matter of fact, there are many places it will show us to fear Him. Just because we as a modern-day church have been trying to remove the fear of God doesn't mean the Scriptures say we are supposed to. So let us uh, close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would help us to have that healthy fear of God, that we would not fall short of the rest to come. Not because it is dependent upon our works, but because it's dependent upon our belief, our belief in you, and that when we truly believe something, we live it out. And when we truly believe the gospel, we will live out that gospel and follow your commands and teach others to do the same. Not that this inheritance is because of our works, but it is because of our belief in those that works and the belief go hand in hand. So Lord, empower us with your Holy Spirit and help us to obey. And Lord, thank you that when we do not obey, when we fail, when we do what we do not want to do, as Paul said, that we can rest in the assurance of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ the blood that he shed, that has paid for, and not just covered, but took away our sins. And for that, Lord, we give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.